Wonderful. Well, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for coming on this blustery Chicago day. Um, I'm excited to talk to you about nutrition to fight inflammation because it's really important to me and I just um, love talking about it. So hopefully you'll love hearing about it. Before I start, I thought I'd tell you my personal um, story as well. I am a dietitian, and ironically, I didn't realize how um, I would come to use nutrition for my life. I became a dietitian first and then kind of had these health issues come along that nutrition became a very important role in. So just kind of give you a brief history of my medical history. Um, started off with autoimmune thyroid disease many, many years ago, dealt with that, and then about 10 years after getting that diagnosis, I got diagnosed with celiac disease. Um, while I was dating my, um, what would soon be my husband. So celiac disease, some of you probably are aware of, is an autoimmune disease where you can't tolerate gluten. Gluten is this trigger in the autoimmune disease, and it basically destroys your small intestines. So um, symptoms of celiac disease can be you know, weight loss and diarrhea and malabsorption of food and nutrients. So got, got that diagnosis and was told, follow a gluten-free diet and you'll be good to go, you know. So I did that as a dietitian. I actually went and met with the dietitian that specialized in celiac disease, since that wasn't my specialty at the time, followed a gluten-free diet and actually started getting worse, um, which was really concerning because I was pretty sick at the time I got diagnosed. Um, so went back to my gastroenterologist and said, something's wrong, I'm following the gluten-free diet. They're like, are you sure you're following the gluten-free diet? I'm like, I'm a dietitian, I can barely eat anything, I'm following the gluten-free diet. So then got diagnosed with another autoimmune disease at that time. It was about two weeks after my celiac diagnosis, which was microscopic colitis. So got that diagnosis. Um, took me a while to get better. Um, got some medications. Um, and then was doing fairly well, I would say. Got married, uh, had children. And it was after my second child, my daughter, where I just felt like some of these health issues were coming back, um, as we know. A lot of triggers for certain diseases can be hormonal shifts, so pregnancy can be a big trigger. Uh, menopause for women can be a big trigger, so I think that the pregnancy was my trigger. And um, during that time, that was a pretty big health crisis because I just felt at that point it was like multiple problems happening. Not only was it my GI system, but I was having muscle spasms and neuropathy and numbness and tingling and back pain, debilitating where I couldn't move. Um, so I went, as I'm sure many of you in this room have, to many doctors and specialists and got referred to many different specialists, rheumatologists, neurologists, neurosurgeons, orthopedic doctors, and um, honestly, I was left with not many answers. So um, nobody could really tell me what was wrong with me. The GI doctor said, what are you doing here? We refer our patients to you for help. So that was a compliment, but also scary at the same time because I needed help. Um, so at that point, it was a kind of a low point, um, and I just delved into nutrition even further. I mean, I studied this. This is my life, my career, but I needed more from my degree, I guess. And so um, I really started researching nutrition to, to heal and fight inflammation and um, started seeing you know, improvements in my health and can definitely say that it was really the power of food and, and some supplements as well that really helped me get, get my life back where I was, you know, that time I was scared. Am I gonna be able to take care of my children because my, my health was failing me? And so definitely um, things have changed and, and definitely this, is, this experience has helped me help my patients. So I have no doubt I am supposed to be a dietitian and talking about nutrition to people. So just wanted to give you that little background because I'm very passionate about nutrition and feel strongly because I see the power of it in my life and in my patients' lives. So. Before I get into the actual talk about nutrition and inflammation, I thought it would be important to talk about what's out there on diet and spondylitis. And I'm sure all of you in this room have tried to find um, and maybe conflicting information about that, but I was looking at the research. And one of the research articles comes from um, 2013, and this is a core set of recommendations for patients with AS. And this was just a very general article, but it did say they recommended reduction in meat consumption, which I'm sure some of you have heard that before. Uh, they recommended increased consumption of fish and vegetarian meals and sufficient intake of calcium and vitamin D. So calcium or vitamin D is something that most people I see, especially in this area, are very deficient in, and most of my patients with immune 
immune diseases are deficient in. So, um, you know, we definitely can check those levels easily and recommend a calcium and vitamin D supplement. So that was just, um, again, an article from um, Rheumatology International from 2013. Um, moving on to 2017, this was a sy systematic review on relationship between diet and spondylitis. And this was interesting. This article suggested that there could be intestinal bacterial flora that may be affected by diet. And diet could influence the intestinal flora and might have a positive effect on disease activity. So this is a really interesting area in the medical world right now. Uh, if any of you have read or you know, heard about the microbiome, which is we all have a microbiome made up of trillions of good and bad bacteria in our gut. And sometimes that bacteria can get affected differently by infections or environmental factors and throw off that gut bacteria. And they're linking certain gut bacteria with certain diseases. So it's really interesting um, when we start talking about the microbiome. So this article is kind of acknowledging that um, involvement possibly and talks about, this is a different article, um, also talking about the microbiome involvement, talking about 70% of patients with AS have subclinical gut inflammation. So I'm not sure if many of you in the room experience any gut issues or if you've heard that um, it is associated with more irritable bowel disease or irritable bowel syndrome. So really interesting when you start having, you know, issues in your joints, that, but then a lot of my patients, even with other autoimmune disease, I'll ask, well, do you have any other GI issues? Do you have constipation? Do you have diarrhea? Do you have bloating? And a lot of these people are having these signs. So you think they're unrelated, but they can be related kind of thing. So leaky gut is a um, very popular topic right now as well. It's found to be greater in AS patients, and this leads to more inflammation. So if you don't know what leaky gut is, it's basically, um, there's, in our intestines, there should be these tight junctions kind of sealing our intestines. And when the gut is damaged, there can be too much space in between those tight junctions. And things that are not supposed to get out of the intestines are getting out of the intestines and causing health issues. So, um, you know, there's, it's proposed that this is creating a lot of chronic diseases or leading to chronic diseases is this uh, leaky gut. In this article, um, they did say that probiotic use and treatment of AS is inconclusive. So probiotics are very popular. They're the good bacteria that you can buy in a supplement form. I don't know if anybody's taken those or are familiar with those, but um, in this study, they did find it to be inconclusive. I will say in my practice, I do use probiotics a lot in various disease states. So. Going back to this article um, from 2016, it said a number of studies have demonstrated that Klebsiella pneumoniae plays a role in the disease of AS. So this specific disease, or not sorry, this specific bacteria has been found to be higher in AS patients. So in this study, they said a possible alternative treatment could be aimed at eliminating this Klebsiella to improve or stop some inflammatory damage. So really interesting, um, I think, and it goes on to say that they proposed a low-starch diet as a means of reducing Klebsiella bacteria in the gut. Um, so they did a study on 36 patients uh, with AS who benefited from a low-starch diet. So um, they actually looked at markers um, and saw significant drops in sed, sed rate, anti-inflammatory medicines, and patients reported decrease in pain and symptoms. So. I don't know if anybody has ever tried like a paleo or a lower carb diet before and noticed improvement in symptoms, and it could be related um, to possibly this low starch connection. So it's, it's really interesting stuff. The systematic review from 2017 came up with this conclusion. Evidence of a possible relationship between AS and diet is extremely limited and inconclusive due to the weakness of the studies. So. Um, that's kind of discouraging, I know, to read at the end of a research article that's looking at all the data out there currently. Um, but it's no surprise, quite honestly, that the information on diet and disease is very limited. There's not a lot of funding for, quite honestly, for diet and disease because we don't have the, the companies backing up, you know, broccoli and spinach and things like that. So, um, and then it's hard to control a diet diet-led study, right? It's hard to get people to follow the exact diet we want them unless we have them in a lab and are feeding them three times a day. So um, hopefully that you'll 
and feeling encouraged after this presentation about some positive effects of um, nutrition to fight inflammation, but right now the research just quite honestly isn't that great specific for the disease. Okay, so moving on to inflammatory foods, and we're going to delve into each of these, but what foods do we know are inflammatory? There's sugar, starch, refined starch I should say, processed foods, red meat, processed meat, some oils, and then I have this category of possibly dairy, gluten, and nightshades. Okay, so we're going to talk about all of these in a little bit more detail. Keep my eye on the time here too. Um, so sugar is the first thing we're going to talk about. That is known to be inflammatory. The Nurses Health Study was a large research study that found a westernized diet high in sweets, desserts, french fries, and refined grains resulted in higher inflammatory markers in the blood. So sugar can definitely be inflammatory, and sugar is everywhere in the American diet. So it's you know, it's in things that you see on this slide, your packaged sweets and treats and cookies and donuts and Sprite. Um, the use of high fructose corn syrup over the years has dramatically increased, um, and they are adding it to everything. So take a look at what you're eating and look at your food labels. You know, high fructose corn syrup is in applesauce, it's in pickles, it's in things that it just doesn't need to be in. It can be the first ingredient in barbecue sauce. Um, so you don't even think you're eating sugar and you're getting it, and um, it's really inflammatory. And, and in my patients, um, once we kind of get them on a, you know, a good diet and they do have something like sugar, sometimes they'll actually say to me, you know, I noticed after that birthday party and I had a ton of cake and ice cream that my joint pain was worse. Or I'll notice that my neuropathy, my numbness and tingling and stabbing pain in my legs is worse after I have sugar. So it becomes very apparent um, and obvious to people once we kind of clean up a diet um, what this food is doing to your body. So the other thing is sugar is very addictive. We know that. So it's hard to limit. You know, it's hard to say, well, I'm just going to have one cookie, you know, because our body wants more. So I get it. Nobody's perfect. But if you are going to treat yourself, I always tell people maybe go out and get the treat. Don't bring the whole pie or the whole cake or the whole box of cookies in the house where you're going to be more tempted to, to, to eat them. So that's sugar. Moving on to refined starch and processed foods. So refined starch is basically anything with made with white flour. So it's going to be your cookies and your bright white bread and your pretzels and Pop-Tarts, donuts, all these things like Nutri-Grain bars, that kind of stuff are all going to contain this refined starch and they're also going to contain a lot of sugar, many of these foods as well. So it's kind of a double whammy. Not only are you getting the refined starch, we know that can be inflammatory, you're getting the sugar. And then processed foods, you know, we just know these in general, which is a lot of the American diet right now because people are looking for convenience foods. Not a lot of people have time um, to, to cook or make things. And so these processed foods are becoming staples and really causing a lot of inflammation. Um, so I just encourage you, if you're looking to start eating healthier, start eating real food, more real food. You know, stay on the outside of the grocery store, on the perimeter of the grocery store where there's your fruits and your vegetables and your meats and your eggs whereas the middle of the grocery store is where you have most of your processed food. So, you know, I use the example of um, sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes is something we make a lot in my house. My kids love sweet potato fries. I think they're very easy to peel, cut sweet potatoes, toss them with some olive oil, maybe some seasoning. So there's maybe three or four ingredients in my sweet potatoes. So fries. So if you go look at sweet potato fries at the store and you go in the freezer section, there can be an, a list this long of ingredients in something like that. And from my standpoint, I've even found gluten in, in sweet potato fries. So sweet potatoes are a naturally gluten-free food, but they're putting wheat in there. So just examples of why you should be paying attention to what you're eating and what can be you know, contributing to more inflammation in your body. Okay, moving on to the red and processed meats. I know, you know, we all, many of us probably love our red meat, but red meat is associated with higher inflammatory markers in many studies. It may increase oxidative stress and inflammation. So we're talking about red and processed meats, we're talking about beef, and then we're talking about your whole class of, you know, kind of brats, hot dogs, salami, um, that whole class. Ham is going to be a processed meat. Um, so really limiting that. We, oops. I thought there was one more slide on that. We know um, 
Also, that red meat is associated with uh, higher rates of cancer. I did a big colon cancer presentation a couple years ago, and that, that was huge. Um, red meat and processed meats are definitely linked to colon cancers and more cancers. So you can become just a healthier person by probably eating less red meat and processed meat as well. Okay, so oils. Oils um, also can be inflammatory for us. Um, so there's different types of fatty acids. You might have heard that there's omega-6 fatty acids, there are omega-3 fatty acids. And basically, the American diet is too high in omega-6. So the ratio of omega-6 is very high compared to omega-3s. And we know when we have this increase in ratio of omega-6 to omega-3, that this can increase inflammatory processes and consequently predispose or exacerbate many inflammatory diseases. So we think this is just contributing to more inflammation in the disease state when you have more omega-6. So what does that mean? This next slide just kind of shows you the oils that have higher contents of omega-6. So you'll see your sunflower oil, your safflower, your corn oil, your soybean oil here. Um, and most of these oils are not going to have any omega-3s. The one oil you don't see up there is um, olive oil. Olive oil doesn't, add, doesn't have a lot of omega-6. It doesn't necessarily have a lot of omega-3s. It kind of has more omega-9s. So olive oil would be probably one of the better oils to be using. Um, you can see flaxseed is very high in omega-3s. So omega-3s are good for us. We're going to talk about that a little bit later more in detail. But flaxseed and fish have um, some of the highest content of these omega-3, these good fatty acids that we want. Okay. So moving um, along, still talking about which foods are inflammatory. Um, dairy. So I do have a question mark here. This is kind of starting our possibly can be inflammatory foods, and dairy is going to be under that. So I know people love their dairy and love their cheese, so many people don't want to hear about that dairy can be inflammatory, but um, basically diets high in meat, red meat, meat in general, and dairy are higher in arachidonic acid, and that's a precursor to some of these pro-inflammatory prostaglandins, and I'll kind of show um, a slide in a little bit to explain that. So meat and dairy can be associated basically with more inflammation. Diets low in arachidonic acid have shown to improve clinical signs of inflammations in pa patients specifically. That study was looking at patients with rheumatoid arthritis. So, um, and that's the arachidonic acid that's higher in uh, meat and in dairy. Dairy can also be high in saturated fats. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about saturated fats. Saturated fats are not good for our heart health. They're found in dairy, like your high-fat dairy products, like cheese and cream and whole milk. These are going to be sources of um, saturated fat, as well as your high-fat meats, like um, bacon, sausage, hot dogs. That whole group is high in saturated fat, and we believe that saturated fat is also inflammatory as well. So kind of dairy could be getting, you know, in causing inflammation from both those standpoints. There was a study published in the Journal of Nutrition in 2015 found that eating dairy and foods increased low-grade inflammation in a small sample of adults. So there's your limitation. The end of the sentence there is in a small sample of adults, right? But um, that's why they can say that the, the research for dairy isn't necessarily conclusive because there needs to be more research because maybe the research studies currently are too small um, and may be problematic. But there was a study in 2015 showing that increased eating of dairy foods caused inflammation. Okay, so leading, we're moving on to gluten. Gluten, as I talked about earlier, is a protein found in wheat, rye, and barley, and oats are contaminated with gluten because oats are grown in the fields next to wheat, so they do have gluten. And gluten can be a hard to digest protein for a lot of people and make increased inflammation in those who are gluten sensitive. So there's celiac disease, which we have out there. Celiac disease is an autoimmune disease I, you know, that I have that you know, is definitely, we know the trigger is gluten. But there's people out there, there's people out there that I screen that I think are going to be positive for celiac disease because they are presenting very classic celiac disease-wise, but they come up negative. So maybe those patients are more just gluten sensitive and just do better on a gluten-free diet even though they don't have celiac disease. So we definitely know celiac disease is more common in people who have autoimmune issues. They say if you have celiac disease, you're more likely to have more autoimmune diseases. 
Um, so anytime I start somebody on a gluten-free diet, I want them to be screened. It's just a blood test. I want them to have the blood test for celiac disease before we start the gluten-free diet. Now the reasoning for that is because once you eliminate gluten from your diet, and say you come to see me six months later and tell me you're on a gluten-free diet, and I say, oh darn, I wanted to screen you for celiac disease. I wanted you to get the blood test to see if you have celiac, but we can't now because you're gluten-free and the test won't be accurate. The blood test is inaccurate if you're already gluten-free. So that's why I wanna rule out celiac disease before I try a gluten-free diet for anybody because Celiac disease, avoiding gluten is, I mean, very strict. You have to avoid the crumbs and, you know, cross-contamination at restaurants becomes very, very challenging. So living with that disease um, is, is a total lifestyle change for sure. So we do want to screen for that. Um, it has been proposed people with immune-related diseases may be more gluten sensitive. So I have kind of come across that in my patients with more um, immune-related diseases, that they, they just seem to do a little better um, without gluten. So that's not surprising, and just again, um, talking about um, the importance of screening for celiac disease. And so just to review, gluten is found in breads and pastas and, you know, cereals, um, it's everywhere. Gluten is everywhere. There are obviously a lot of gluten-free alternatives now. And then there's just naturally gluten-free foods such as potatoes and sweet potatoes are naturally gluten-free. Rice and quinoa are naturally gluten-free. Beans and lentils and legumes are gluten-free. So there's plenty of gluten-free options out there. And it kind of, if you do it right, I tell people if you do gluten-free right, you can eat a really healthy diet if you start eating real foods. But, you know, there's gluten-free everything now. There's gluten-free donuts, there's gluten-free Pop-Tarts. So it could be just as of a junky diet as, as the standard American diet now because there's so many options. I mean, it's nice. It's nice for people with celiac disease and kids to be able to get a treat. Um, but we just don't want to be choosing those gluten-free treats more than the real food. Okay. Nightshades. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard about nightshades, but am I on the wrong slide all the time? There we go, sorry. Um, so nightshades um, are plants such as tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, and potatoes. So this class of vegetables is not research proven to cause inflammation, but nightshades may be problematic for some people with immune-related diseases due to their lectin and saponin content, which may cause an overactive immune response. So I'll have to tell you, a few years ago when I started getting into functional medicine and I read about nightshades causing issues in people, as a dietitian, I thought this was the craziest thing I had ever heard because these are healthy foods and these are real foods and these are vegetables. Um, and how could something so natural be causing inflammation in people? And I won't say it's common, but I have had patients react to nightshades, um, to tomatoes, peppers, and, and really notice their symptoms, kind of they feel their symptoms get a little worse with these foods. So it's nothing I ever eliminate at the beginning. I never want to overly restrict people on their diet. Um, I want people's diet to be, you know, as full as of many food options as they can. But if somebody's coming to see me and they've made so many diet changes and they're not seeing much improvements, that might be an option we look into is possibly seeing um, if the removal of the nightshades helps. So it's interesting, um, interesting kind of area there is the nightshades. Okay. So that was all the inflammatory foods. Now we're going to kind of move over to the anti-inflammatory foods. And we're going to be focusing a lot in this section on vegetables and omega-3 fatty acids. Okay, so vegetables are superfoods, um, for sure. I'm sure you've heard this before, and we've all been told our whole life to, to eat our vegetables. Um, but what I find is that Americans really aren't eating their vegetables. We're eating everything but, or maybe a serving a day, uh, but if these are superfoods, and these are something that can be very helpful for us, this really needs to be a huge part of our diet. And if you have a chronic disease, even more reason to try to include more vegetables in your diet. So we're going to delve into that a little bit more. It's not the answer people want. You know, I feel like people come to me and they want to um, either lose weight or help their chronic disease or have more energy or better manage their diabetes. And usually, um, you know, I'm always talking about eating more vegetables. And it's, 
people want the end product, they want the reward, they want all the benefit of good health and weight loss and energy, but they're very disappointed um, when we talk about vegetables and tell me how much they don't like vegetables or how they only like certain vegetables or you know that kind of stuff. So I think working with a good dietitian that can help you figure out how to get a vegetables in, in your life is, is really important. So. Uh, we know that vegetables contain vitamins and minerals and phytonutrients, and these things can strengthen your immune system and mitochondria, improve your nervous system, promote healthy gut bacteria. We talked a lot early on about the importance of good gut, gut bacteria and help decrease inflammation. So if you look at this slide and see all the things that vegetables can do, um, it's really pretty amazing. And if I had a pill, if I had a pill that can do all these things, I would probably be a millionaire, right? So uh, really, really talk, um, focusing on how you can get more vegetables in your diet. So we're gonna start with leafy greens. Leafy greens, um, examples can be arugula, bok choy, chard, kale, spinach, mustard greens, lettuce, but not iceberg lettuce, we're looking at more of the dark leafy green lettuces or red lettuces. We know these are high in phytochemicals and these have um, anti-inflammatory properties in these vegetables. So there's tens of thousands of phytochemicals have been identified and research, researchers speculate that there's likely many more that we haven't even discovered in the food that we eat. So these phytochemicals are often thought to help, help different pathways and help in disease prevention. So what they're saying is, is there's so much nutrition in vegetables we probably haven't even discovered all the nutrition and the benefits of it. So. Leafy greens are a good source of these phyto, phytochemicals. Okay. They're also a good source of vitamin A and vitamin C. We know definitely vitamin C is very involved in your immune cell function, skin and gums, and healthy skin and gums. And these are high in antioxidants as well. Antioxidants you've heard probably about are natural substances that may prevent or delay some types of cell damage and protect against diseases. So antioxidants are really important to be including in our diet. Okay. Um, leafy greens are also a, a huge source of vitamin K, so that does become an issue if people are on um, Coumadin, a medication where you have to kind of watch how much vitamin K you're taking in. It's also a great source of B vitamins such as folate, which is important for your nervous system. So mixing up your vegetables, you know, kale is very popular right now as being a superfood, and kale is a, is, is a great vegetable, but it's not the only healthy green vegetable. So making sure you're getting in different vegetables, you know, your spinach, um, your chard, and your different lettuces are, can be some examples. And arugula, I love arugula, and I think um, it's often an overlooked vegetable. Um, the next class is gonna be your colored vegetables. So. The deep color in these vegetables is a sign of their different vitamins and antioxidants and phytonutrients. So um, asparagus and beets and your peppers, things like red, orange, and yellow peppers, red cabbage, carrots, tomatoes, zucchini, and squash, all would be a part of this um, colored vegetable family. And again, we know that antioxidants help stop free radicals from doing damage to our cells. And if you have um, a disease, there's constantly damage going on into your cells that we're trying to stop. So studies prove that antioxidants are protective against cancer, dementia, and cardiovascular disease, and phytonutrients help decrease inflammation and improve the health of our cells and strengthen our immune system. So, such so good for you trying to get in a variety of these different vegetables and you know it's like what I tell people maybe you didn't like cabbage or you didn't like peppers when you're a kid but that doesn't mean you don't like them now so really being open to trying new new types of vegetables and foods I think is really important the next class of vegetables is your cruciferous vegetables um, this is a very popular category your broccoli, your Brussels sprouts, cabbage, and cauliflower make up this group. This group has been very studied um, to be anti-cancer, so um, these are always recommended for patients for um, anti-cancer prevention. Uh, they're also high in sulfur compound called glucosinolate, which may play an important role in disease prevention by triggering antioxidants and anti-inflammatory responses and contributing to the maintenance of cell balance. So basically, helping keep your cells healthy these vegetables contain this specific sulfur compound, glucosinolate, that can help with that. 
So I think these vegetables are some of the most popular vegetables, and they can be prepared in lots of different ways. You know, you can do um, broccoli salads, you can do roasted broccoli, you can do Brussels sprouts, Brussels sprout slaw with raw vegetables. Roasting, roasting all these vegetables, if, if you're not crazy about them, I feel like it's one of the ways to just bring out maximum flavor in vegetables, just roasting at like 400 degrees with a little olive oil, salt and pepper. And um, if you take broccoli cauliflower florets and do that, and can, they can roast very quickly in like 15 minutes. And they crisp up a little bit, and my kids just like pick them up and eat them like French fries. So um, there's a lot of different ways to prepare this. Cauliflower is very popular and trendy food right now. I don't know if any of you guys have tried the cauliflower rice or heard about this. You can use cauliflower rice as a substitute. There's cauliflower pizza crust. Um, so lots to do. Who knew cauliflower could be so versatile? So. Um, being open-minded to trying some of these things, you know, people are like, when I tell them about cauliflower rice, I'm like, yeah, you could do, instead of using, you know, rice in your stir fry, you could use cauliflower. And I realize it kind of sounds crazy, but until you try it, you know, you got to mix it and get flavors in there to kind of make it taste good. But I think it fools your brain because I can be eating it and like feel like I'm eating rice, but it's really cauliflower. So um, minimum, we say at lunch and dinner, your plate should be half vegetables. Half your plate should be vegetables is a minimum. Okay, so the cruciferous vegetables, these ones we almost uh, or just talked about, are going to be high in folate, vitamin C, K, potassium, selenium, calcium, and phytonutrients. So tons, tons of nutrition here. Moving on to our um, sulfur vegetables. So sulfur-rich foods nourish the cell and the mitochondria. The mitochondria is referred to as the powerhouse of the cell. And helps get the body get rid of toxins, these sulfur-rich foods. Sulfur is also involved in protein synthesis and for making collagen, and collagen makes up the connective tissue, which helps strengthen our joints. Sulfur also helps strengthen the line of our blood vessels. So these are, you know, really great foods, these sulfur-rich foods. Um, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, so it's that whole cruciferous family, those foods as well as onions, leeks, garlic, and mushrooms. And one I forgot to add here is radish as well. Radishes are on there too. So um, great foods. You know, these can be in raw or cooked. Um, I always kind of, this is one thing we teach um, to families and parents is, um, when we're trying to get kids to eat healthy, because people will always tell, well, I had to make this meal, but then I got to make another meal for my family because they won't eat this food. And we're always encouraging that there's one healthy meal for the family. Um, so when we talk about how to trying to get kids to eat more fruits and vegetables, things like that, we say get the kids involved in grocery shopping, take them to the store, let them pick out a new fruit or vegetable, um, maybe that they haven't tried before, you know, get them involved in preparing it and then have them try it and they might like it. So an example, I think probably when my daughter was five, you know, we did that at the grocery store and she picked out radishes. And radishes, like I didn't really eat much of, we never bought them. I just never really thought about radishes ever, except if they were in a salad, maybe at a restaurant. So we bought those and just served them with hummus. And she loved, I was like thinking in my head, okay, yeah, cut it up, you know, let's see how you like it. And thinking she's never going to like a radish because they're kind of strong flavor. Um, and she likes them. So now if she has vegetable with her lunch or something, she picks radishes. I eat them with guacamole now. So it just goes to show you, you know, that we all need to be open to trying new foods and, um, and you can really enjoy them. And I'm, I'm a firm believer, and I see this in my practice, that the more vegetables you eat, the more your body craves. I think when you start giving your body the proper nutrition and the vitamins and minerals and all these phytonutrients that we're talking about, that your body actually starts craving those foods, especially when you get rid of the sugar and the processed foods that are addicting. So when you start giving your body the proper nutrition, I, I swear, my body will start craving vegetables. So um, try it and see, and you'll get a lot of benefits out of this if you do, but the, this group is, is really healthy as well. So how many vegetables should you eat per day? So for the average American, the recommendation is three to five servings. Um, for somebody with chronic disease and battling inflammation, I would say eight to nine cups a day. So I realize that's a ton of vegetables, right? I know eight to nine cups sounds like it's not possible. How can you possibly eat that much vegetables? But it is. And that's where I think sometimes working one-on-one -on -one with a dietitian can be helpful too to help you get these vegetables in your diet. Okay, 
So there's some tips on the next slide here of how to, how to do this. Oops. So how to eat more veggies. Raw veggies with hummus or guacamole are some of my favorite ways. Um, and guacamole, we always think of serving it with tortilla chips, I know, which we all love. But try it with ve as a vegetable dip. I mean, I love guacamole, and it makes every vegetable taste better, I think. So, and now they even have, for people's lunches, these little convenient packs of um, individual hummus and, and guacamole. So it can be, you know, something quick and easy to pack as well. So raw veggies with hummus um, can be great. Roasting vegetables, I already talked about that. I think roasting is a, is a great way to bring out flavor in vegetables. Steamed vegetables, you know, is quick and easy. You just don't want to steam in a lot of water, right? You just want a little bit of water because you're going to lose nutrients if you, if you have too much water. You see if you boil vegetables, you see the, the water turn like green or turn the color. That's the nutrition coming out into the water, so you're losing some of that if you, if you use too much water. Salads can be obviously a great way to get in a lot of vegetables. If you can make a huge salad for a meal and add in, you know, peppers and mushrooms and cucumbers and then, you know, add in some, you know, healthy things like guacamole or avocado slices, um, sunflower seeds, that kind of stuff can be great in salads. Veggie-based meals in general, just trying to make a more veggie-based meal. Things like um, a veggie chili or maybe a... Um, a veggie-based taco where you take some black beans and mushrooms and, and make that into a taco instead of a meat-based taco. And then veggie-based smoothies. Has anybody tried any veggie-based smoothies at all? Some of you, a couple of you have? Okay. So um, when we're talking about trying to get eight to nine cups of vegetables a day, uh, one of the greatest ways i found is to try to get um, smoothies. So I try to use this. This is what I call my starter smoothie recipe um, because I don't try to go too overboard, but it has about two to three handfuls of spinach. I start with spinach because that can be a little bit more mild than kale um, or some of the other greens that can be a little more bitter. So two to three th large handfuls of spinach, one to two carrots, and even if you wanted to not try it with carrots the first time, you could. Half a banana, a cup of frozen fruit, um, like mango, pineapple, or berries, the banana really helps mask the flavor of the greens, so I do think that if you like bananas, put it in there because it's going to help the smoothie taste better. This also has some flaxseed in it. You want to get the milled flaxseed, not the actual whole flaxseeds. And then um, fill up your blender and fill up about half your blender with a liquid of your choice. That could be water or almond milk, coconut milk, whatever liquid you would like to use, and then blend that for one to two minutes. So... This can be a great way to get in three cups of vegetables or more. Um, it can be a great way to start your day. Um, I have a smoothie, a vegetable-based smoothie every day, and now it's like my body wants that. So um, highly recommend that if you are looking to, to up your veggies and to help with the inflammation. Okay. So moving on from the vegetables to other anti-inflammatory components of foods, and that's the omega-3 fatty acids. How many people have heard about omega-3 fatty acids before? A little bit, most of you, right? Okay, so we know, as we talked about earlier, there's both omega-3 and omega-6 essential fatty acid. We know the American diet probably has too much of the omega-6, right? So this next slide is going to show you um, the differences here. So we have the omega-6 on one side. That's made up of a lot of vegetable oils, margarines, nuts, seeds, and some um, conventional meats also kind of make up this omega-6 component as well. The omega-6 um, then converts to linoleic acid, then gamma-linoleic acid, and there's that arachidonic acid that we saw earlier, if you guys remember in the presentation when we talked about that being high in meat and dairy, and we can see that these lead to more pro-inflammatory cytokines. So this is just kind of a cascade of reactions happening that's promoting more inflammation when you have more omega-6. Now on the flip side, if you look on the other side, we have your omega-3s, which we're going to talk a little bit more in detail where you get that. But it's like your salmon, your tuna, your mackerel, the flaxseed that we're putting in the smoothie, that's going to be a source of the omega-3s. Um, that converts to what we call ALA, then to EPA and DHA, and these have anti-inflammatory effects. So the majority of DHA and EPA um, are found in our... Um, cold water fatty fish like flax and flax seeds, 
and salmon, and we're going to kind of talk about um, the other types of fish as well. So we definitely know the American diet too high in omega-6, too low in omega-3s. So how can you kind of up your intake of omega-3s is here. You have your salmon, your anchovies, your herring, Pacific mackerel, not king mackerel, sardines, which are kind of a, an easy way if you do like those, trout, and then flaxseed. These are also lower in mercury. So these sources of omega-3 are kind of your best sources of omega-3s, but also being your lowest in mercury. Um, one thing I don't have on here is the um, fish oil supplement. How many people, if you don't care sharing, are taking a fish oil supplement? Okay. So the fish oil supplements obviously can be a great source of the uh, omega-3s as well. So both animal and clinical studies support the use of omega-3 fatty acids in treating autoimmune diseases such as RA, inflammatory bowel disease, and others. So another slide here just talking, showing you the different content of the omega-3s. Um, the salmon being the highest, herring, sardines, trout, also giving you some. The shrimp is low. Okay. Uh, omega-3 studies advocate a lower intake of omega-6 compared to omega-3 in reducing inflammation. We've talked about that. Um, the American Heart Association also does recommend eating fish, particularly the fatty fish that's high in the omega-3s, at least twice a week. And they consider, consider a serving uh, three and a half ounces of cooked fish or about three quarters cup of flaked fish. And again, they're referring to fatty fish like salmon, mackerel, herring, lake trout, sardines, albacore tuna, and those are your highest in omega-3s. I didn't have the tuna on the last slide just because it can be, have some mercury content. We do recommend that you talk to your doctor or dietitian about dosage for fish oil supplements. The FDA does not recommend exceeding supplements with greater than two grams of combined EPA and DHA daily. So if you are taking a fish oil supplement, you can kind of it's kind of confusing because it says like on the front, a thousand milligrams of omega-3 or something like that. But then when you turn it around, what you really want to look at is the amount of EPA and DHA on, on the supplement. And so the FDA does not recommend going over 2,000 milligrams or two grams of EPA and DHA combined daily. But, you know, there are some people on higher doses. You just have to talk with your doctor about that if you, if you are. So that's the problem with a lot of the studies um, talking about the benefits of fish oil supplement supplementation, they do vary in their dosing. So there's no kind of standard dose recommendation on what's going to be helpful for inflammation. But we definitely know it is. It, uh, it can, and I have seen a lot of people see um, some improvements with fish oil. Okay, so that's kind of the, um, the basics about nutrition to fight inflammation. I wanted to kind of end on a note um, about a couple doctors um, that have inflammatory diseases and they've used nutrition to really um, help heal their diseases. So Brooke Goldner is one doctor. She has this book called Goodbye Lupus. And she talks about her story with lupus. She, I think she's had lupus since she was 16 years old. It got pretty serious in medical school. It started affecting her kidneys and also kind of caused um, a blood disorder as well. Um, she uses a vegan diet and large intake of veggie-based food smoothies with flaxseed. Um, I think she uses about 64 ounces of smoothies, uh, of these veggie-based smoothies, smoothies a day. She is now not on any medications. Um, she's had two pregnancies where that can, as we talked about earlier, that can kind of be a flare for people with autoimmune disease, and her disease has not flared. She has many followers. I'm in one of her groups of many followers with um, autoimmune disease, not just lupus, that are also reporting improvements in symptoms and reduction in their labs. Currently, she does not have any research that I'm aware of. Um, I don't know if she will conduct any in her, in her future, but um, the book kind of talks about her diet and what she did. So it's always nice to hear these positive stories and the power of nutrition. And, um, and it's interesting to see the followers too, because you think, well, she's one person, but then when she has other people following these recommendations and, and getting good results, it's nice to see. The next person I don't know if anybody's heard of is um, Terry Walls. Has anybody heard about her? Um, 
So she is a doctor and she has progressive MS and she said she was, was treated with, at the top hospitals with all the latest medications and her MS kept getting worse. Um, so at that point, she was taking all these medications and just thought, well, what else? What else can I do? So she delved into nutrition research and started changing her diet drastically and took supplements as well. And um, she went from being wheelchair bound to being able to ride a bike and she now is mobile and no longer needs a wheelchair and um, has a great book out talking about her story and the diet. It's, it's really interesting. She has a TED Talk as well. Um, if you just Google Terry Wall's TED Talk, there's millions of people who have probably watched it. Um, it's, it's really good because she tells her story of, she said when she started out in her research, um, she, wasn't ho she didn't even think that she could possibly reverse some of the damage that was done because that just wasn't, that wasn't talked about, that it was possible with MS. She was just looking to stop the progression of the disease. Of, she kept getting worse despite all the medications. So um, the fact that she started getting better, she was just really, really surprised by. So her book is called The Walls Protocol, and she talks about her story. She uses a paleo-based diet. I don't know if you guys are familiar with a paleo-based diet, but it is a low-starch diet because it's a grain-free and dairy-free diet. Um, but she also promotes um, a high vegetable intake. So you can see the common denominator of a lot of these diets is uh, extremely high vegetable intake. Uh, as I said, she went from being wheelchair bound to bike riding and thriving. She still has MS, but her symptoms have dramatically improved and she is conducting research. So that's what's nice is um, she has done a research study and I know she's got more in the works. Um, the, the title of it was the effect of a paleo diet on management of MS. The paleo diet they used in the study included nine cups of vegetables, and they did the three cups of greens, the three cups of colored vegetables, and the three cups of sulfur vegetables. Included um, meat, including protein and organ meats. She had no gluten in the diet, no dairy in the diet, no potatoes in the diet, or legumes. So that was beans, lentils, or peanuts. Um, so it was a high intake of vegetables with all of those components. She did a randomized controlled study and found that the paleo diet may be useful in the management of MS in reducing fatigue, which we know is very common in these immune-related diseases, um, increasing mental and physical quality of life, and increasing hand and leg function. And um, they kind of talked about, you know, they were trying to pinpoint why these results were happening. And one of the things they linked it to was that there was an increase in vitamin, vitamin K levels in these patients that followed this diet. Okay. Um, and that may indicate um, reductions in oxidative cell and mitochondrial damage along with reduced inflammation, perhaps contributing to improved cognitive and motor function, fatigue and quality of life. So they were, they were possibly thinking, but couldn't really say, maybe it was the vitamin K, that's high intake of the vitamin K um, that was helping some of the, the symptoms and the improvements that they saw in the study. But again, we've talked about all the nutrition and these phytonutrients in, in these vegetables and, and these diets that I'm sure can be contributing to a lot of these things as well. So I thought we would end on a positive story like hers. Like I said, she does have that TED Talk if you guys want to learn more about that. And then I am going to open it up to questions. Thank you so much, Laura. Big applause for Laura. Thank you so much for this fantastic presentation.